Welcome to the Funnel Reboot Podcast, brought to you by Marketing What's New. Let's get into today's show. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we're going to talk about data clean rooms. Quick disclaimer. When I bring technology vendors on the show, you should know that they're not sponsors or affiliates. They're simply here to give you a broader perspective. Today's show is about the impasse that digital advertising is at. There's a real problem with companies that have first-party data about audiences which others could benefit from. One way out of this stalemate is a data clean room. Our guest is a customer success engineer, an active amateur soccer and badminton player, and a resident of New York City. He works at a data cleanroom software company called Habu. The goal is to create reliable data and media strategies for clients, and he's responsible to work with Habu's engineering and product teams and clients on workflows that include cleanroom adoption, onboarding, planning, implementing, and growth. They work across distributed data platforms, allowing agencies, publishers, advertisers, and their partners to unlock the potential of data and to collaborate in a privacy-safe way. He's been a data cleanroom enthusiast since the beginning of 2018. Previously, he worked as a digital analytics specialist at Time and as a data science team lead at Mighty Hive, an ad tech agency. He has a BS in computer science, He earned his MS in Marketing Intelligence from Fordham University's Gabelli School of Business with a concentration in Marketing and Analytics. Amid the rise of advanced measurement techniques in media and other industries, he likes to keep learning about these technologies and constantly coming up with new use cases in different industries. He continues his passion for everything related to data cleanrooms and data collaboration at Habu. He hails originally from Indore, India. While there, he worked as a business analyst at Accenture, where he managed analytic solutions for international clients. I want you to come and hear from someone who's young and who brings an upbeat spirit to the work he's doing on this potential solution to the privacy puzzle. Please join me in welcoming Puneet Gangrande. Welcome to Funnel Reboot, Puneet Gangrande. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here, Glenn. I'm glad to have you. So we need to first talk a little bit about how the world of sending ads has been working lately. And if I were to take a quick stab at how it's been working, when we think of display and programmatic, I would say, and we're recording this in early 2023, that It's not going so well. We have a bunch of challenges, let's say. Can you maybe mention what some of those challenges are around us that make the way that we were doing ads a problem? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So there are a couple of things that uh, advertisers, ad tech platforms, and publishers have seen coming. Uh, and all those things are related to the kind of privacy regulations that has came in effect with respect to latest times in the last couple of years. Uh, we have seen that even though programmatic industry has been there for decades, uh, until 2018, we have had not so much stringent privacy regulations, starting with May 2018 with GDPR with other regulations coming in from various regions for California, CCPA, California, CPRA. And in fact, global regulations being produced, if not finalized. What that's leading to is every advertiser, publisher, ad tech platform now has to follow a couple of rules and regulations to make sure that the data that they're collecting is being used in the right way without bypassing any kind of laws. That means, for an example, at this point, we have all heard about a lot of third-party cookie deprecation. And that is one of the, let's just say, a side effect of all of these privacy changes that are happening. And programmatic industry has been largely dependent on third-party cookies with respect to media optimization, with respect to reaching out to new users, 
it has played a crucial role and various browsers from firefox for google's chrome google chrome safari they all have made some of the other changes with respect to cookies so even though the first party cookies are going to stay here there is a big shift that has already started and it's going to continue with respect to how the personal data is being collected and used and that's why we have seen the adaptation of more or maybe let's just say uh, a unique skills needed to be better at serving better ads right so and we'll just pause for a second there uh, i loved that trio of players that you mentioned earlier because when it comes to third party cookies each of them has a piece so you mentioned the publishers you mentioned the advertisers and then you referred to this category that i think fits in between them called ad tech right yes so the third party cookies this would be um what what has happened in the past correct me if i'm wrong is that the advertiser has been able to access information about an audience because the publisher was able to just hand over information to them and the ad tech platform kind of facilitated that um but what we run a foul of there is that the user they're kind of the fourth piece in this puzzle the user never said to the publisher that it was okay for them to do that and of course the advertiser is pretty much only putting their ads on that publisher's placement because they have audience information so we have a problem here of everything could come to a grinding halt if we gave the user the privacy which is coming to be regulated right that's that's the correct interpretation yes so what do we do about that <laughs> there's got to be a solution uh and i'm sure that the ad tech people have been working very hard to try to find a middle ground where publishers and advertisers can use data uh but of course we have to be doing it in a way that complies with the privacy so can you tell us about what has been tried there yes uh so the biggest change that has happened is the evolution of uh, a software and tech called data clean rooms okay these are platforms which allow not just a combination of publishers and advertisers but only publisher sorry only advertiser as well to work on its data until now before data clean rooms came into existence everybody was using the log level information in other words the impression level data click level data and the conversion level data or yes. any kind of pii based data in a let's just say a free environment a uh, free to use environment and this has become stricter than usual so before data clean rooms suppose for an example we query a data we query data for google's campaign manager yes i was able to query for a particular user i was able to not just query not just collect mm -hmm. data so there's a three to four step process collecting the user information storing the user information querying the user information and then exposing the user information and right. this is a a process that has been followed for years now what has changed in the process with respect to data clean rooms is you can collect the data you can store the data you can query the data as well but you will not be able to expose that same user level information to anybody now what that entails as an end result is you may be able to group a couple of users and then analyze them together so in short what's happening is with the help of these privacy regulations which are being now fed into many different platforms or being followed by all kinds of companies now everybody is required to make sure that they are not exposing any kind of user level information and that's what a data clean room allows us to do so it's a piece of software and tech that only a publisher or only an advertiser or only an ad tech platform or a combination of these three or these two can utilize to work on each other's data. Okay, so before we get any further on that, um let's just talk for a second about 
how this is a viable solution. So we have, uh, you know, coming from the days when an advertiser could, and I'm not saying if it's right or wrong, but they could get down to demographic and uh, other forms of targeting, which would get us down to frankly, a singular user. Uh, there have been stories in the past of how this has been used by people to get uh, a particular hiring manager to look at their resume, right? Like dialed in just yeah. down to the individual. So that's clearly um, no longer possible. But for an advertiser to even have the faith that their dollars will be well spent, there has to be some level of uh, users. It can't be you know, aggregated to the world, but if it's aggregated small enough, and let's take the number 50, for example, that if an advertiser can get something down to that where they understand in this grouping, we have some of the entities, some of the parties that you wanna reach, but you don't have a uh, there, there's too many of them for you to tease apart who the individuals are in there. So am I right that we're finding this place in the middle where it's still targeted, but it's still vague enough that the advertiser will still advertise? Yes, that's, that's the correct interpretation. In fact, it empowers a lot of different kinds of use cases as well, because... Now, both the parties, the publishers, the advertisers, and the users can rest assured that they are not trying to break any kind of rule and still get a lot out of its data. So, yeah, okay. it allows for even extra opportunities. So, I think it like this in my mind, like even though a couple of doors were shut because of a lot of privacy regulations came in place, but then it became a kind of a scavenger hunt where we have still options out there. And all we have to do is just be a little tricky, uh, be available and listen to what are the different data points telling us, write a logic in a way that we are not uh, exposing anybody's personal data or user level information. Yeah, and I can see that. I mean, you're describing something obviously that's done in code, but if I picture it using the word clean room, I can almost imagine what you're describing. I can imagine there being maybe a big boardroom table in it and we have advertisers coming in and then we have a publisher coming in and there's information that does not leave that room, but both sides have taken their data through some hygiene processes and they've sanitized it. They've anonymized it, yes. but that information that sits in that, you know, virtual room is, it can be safely used by all sides. That... Exactly. Okay. Excellent. So you talked for a second when you were first mentioning this about there being um, clean room software, and you made the distinction between that and a clean room. Can you explain that for a moment? Uh, sure. So the first clean room that came into existence and which is now became becoming famous and being widely used uh, started in 2017 by google so i'll 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 share the before and after story so that it becomes extremely clear as to why a software on top of a clean room makes a difference okay right so google's clean room is called ads data hub in which we allow to, in which we get to work on google's media data amazon's clean room is called amazon marketing cloud in which we get to work on Amazon ads data, uh, sponsored search, display ads, all those kinds of data. Facebook's clean room is called Facebook Advanced Analytics, and we get to work on Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Now, these things have come in as independent solutions. Uh, of course, there are some requirements to get onboarded and all those things. But at the bottom line, the bottom line between all these three things is that you need a person who can write an SQL query along with some media managers to make a use of its own platform. And let's just say it's, these are decentralized platforms because they independently work off each other at all times. Now, I will work on Google's infrastructure separately. That means I need to have people who know Google's knowledge, Google infrastructure's knowledge. Then if I am working on Amazon's data, I need to know people who know, who understand and who work in Amazon ads, Amazon data, and also at the same time need 
people who can write SQL and analyze that data. Similarly, decentralized and done separately is a Facebook analytics data. Now, what a clean room software does right now is it sits on top of these three. And I'm going to just bring in one word that is an API connection for a while. Okay. These three platforms offer API connections. Our software uses, a software would use an API connection in the background to make a very business friendly user interface. And if an advertiser wants to work on its own data on Google or Facebook or Amazon, they would be able to use a software layer such as Habu or any other mm-hmm. in this case to work on things that would make the life of the advertiser and its team a little easier. That means we can have business friendly insights, business friendly user interface. You can unify the insights with respect to data visualizations. You may or may not be able to like, we, you may not need to write SQL from scratch because a software will have already uh, uh, common use cases to work on. So these things make a bigger team's goal a little easier to achieve. I'll pause over here for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's a it's a great explanation. Uh, it uh, does allow for marketers to be creative, which is what marketers are, are legendary for. Um, are we are we saying you mentioned that the advertisers bringing their data? Are we saying that the type of data that they're bringing is information from their analytics, from maybe uh, other systems which they deal with uh, customer data on, but it's about information that helps them understand maybe what the lifetime value of a customer is, or whether people with you know attributes A, B, and C have a higher propensity to buy from them than prospects that have you know X, Y, and Z. Uh, is that what we're saying? Is is the advertiser bringing in information that is um, infusing that query that's being done with information that uh, is first party to them? Yes, that, that's the correct way to start the, the analysis of uh, any kind of a use case. So yes, yeah. uh, uh, an advertiser along with the standard data that's made available by Google, suppose if you're working in a Google Ads Data Hub environment, Yes. What kind of data that an advertiser can bring to enrich not just the data, but also the use case. So data such as CRM data, web analytics data from Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics. We can bring in loyalty program data, offline sales data, and any kind of consumer survey or consumer interaction data that you can gather. All you have to do is just bring it in the same place where the clean room can address and use that data. And mm-hmm. we will be able to work on even way more powerful use cases, as you highlighted, around uh, uh, propensity or LTV. So use cases can start from one direction and can lead into multiple things, such as if I am using these kind of data sets together, then I would be able to address the problems of understanding what's my performance across multiple channels. When I'm using multiple channels and when I'm having ad spend in various directions, my not all the channels are going to perform the same. So I may need to keep a tap on how each of these are performing individually as well as how they are performing together. That's one way to look at the performance of the media data. Another way to look at or another problem that can be addressed and completely solved, in fact, with the help of a data clean room, whether it's Google, Amazon, Facebook, or any other, is that we can understand how the waste of ad spend is happening at all, if at all. So such as if I am showing extra exposures to the users or if I am re- my retargeting is not as effective as expected or whether if I am actually targeting the right people or not. So things like right kind of targeting, right kind of consumer sets, whether I'm going into the right use case and solving the right problem or not can be addressed with the help of data clean rooms. There are many other use cases, but I'll just take a pause for now. Great. And so the idea of these rooms, uh, it's, I suppose we have to think of them as being a framework that new methods can be tried. As you said, we can iterate on these things and we have to because in digital things never stay the same. Um, the, you mentioned retargeting, uh, am I right that 
one of the things that does seem evident is that clean rooms will, with the process of maturing, the clean rooms will be able to give us options which an advertiser could consider to be on par with how retargeting used to work. And this is because retargeting is 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 undoubtedly going to suffer as browsers deprecate cookies. And so are we saying that clean rooms, we may not know exactly what shape that has right now, but that clean rooms will be the place where the solution, the replacement is going to come. Yes. So uh, another way, to, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the right way to put it. Uh, another way to look at this is when the clean room is going to be the only place to analyze the data because it allows for that safety, we can slice and dice the data that we want. Whether we And if I have to go into the details, we can slice and dice the data either by region, by brand, by product categories, by campaigns and whatnot. And yeah. that's why we would be able to go to such granularity that understanding each and every kind of retargeting tactic would be possible. And it's still possible. So what it allows us to do step by step in this case is we take a learning from one kind of a use case about retargeting users. Then we take another learning from another retargeting use use case. And then we combine all those learnings to come up with a business decision that a media manager would be able to take and go back and plug it into a DSP. Right. So it becomes a mechanism. A data clean room provides a mechanism and let's just say it allows for that detailed analysis. Analysis, analysis. yes. But I think one thing that uh, you're mentioning here, and I think I know where you're going with it, is that the analysis is on models um, and that the software is using so much data that marketers are going to have to adjust from the old style of thinking where they had, you know, uh, if, if they had a thousand people in a audience that had been past visitors to their site, they're imagining in their minds, there's actually a file somewhere with a thousand cookie IDs. In this case, what you're speaking about at that granular level, it exists, but how you're actually applying it is not literally like taking those cookie IDs and moving them over, but you're instead letting AI or, you know, some of your advanced data scientists come up with the way to deploy that media by, but they're doing it at a higher level. Um, they're, they've taken the learnings from that granular data, but they're not actually pushing that granular data into their next buy, correct? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there, there's two ways to look at it. Uh, one is if you're finding something like an audience that would work better, then you would use that directly as an activation audience for sending it to your new campaigns. Or okay. if you have realized from your analysis that a particular audience is not going to behave or work well, and it's not going to be as efficient in terms of return on ad spend, then you can directly push it as an activation for suppression audience. So this is, this do the, the clean rooms do allow for direct activating mechanisms for frequency capping, audience right. inclusion, audience exclusion. And in fact, when it comes to, this is not just about a data clean room and pushing it to the, another way to look at this is when a particular use case is running for a couple of months, the software will be able to analyze the trend on its own from the monthly reports. Suppose if I have 12 months, 12 reports data, a software would be able to give you alerts. So what we are trying to do differently in this case is media manager media managers cannot spend day in day out into the reports because it's a little unrealistic ask same similarly an executive will not keep looking at the reports at all times so right. one part is activation as a logical uh, move towards understanding who is the right audience and who is not but at the same time the software piece will also make it easier for the people working around the clean room to find the nuggets that will help them make better business decisions. And that's where a concept of, suppose, alerts would come in. So a data clean room software can give you an alert when a, suppose, ROAS goes lower than 0.5 because it's a very, like, it's a flag. 
it's a red flag right. or when somebody is seeing more than 50 impressions in a week so these things are capable or let's just say capabilities of a data clean room software which is done or which is being which is happening on the top of the user level information available to us on the top of yes so and i'm going to speak like a uh, you know a person who's been at this uh and done it the old fashioned way um i'm homing in on that word activation you used so when i think of how any kind of data has been used by marketers and i'm talking from let's say the year you know the late 90s to maybe the close to the present it has been we always talked about actionable data actionable insights from data that you yes. would as a human look at the data decide how you know okay this is new information what am i going to do with it and then you would then as a person manually go in and as you said change a frequency number or change a roas target am i hearing right that when you talk about data being activated that that is now something that software is taking the role of uh i've seen acronyms like pair being used by google p a i r and uh, uh, just help me understand this activation it can actually be automated and in fact that's the intent that's the intent yes so for an example uh, as you highlighted about the google pair uh, i have an example to highlight for that so google pair stands for publisher ident- uh, publisher advertiser identity reconciliation that means when two parties were not actually able to share the data with each other because they have no reason to trust with trust each other at this point google is coming up with a solution that allows for two or more parties to trust each other what it does is none of the party has to only share the data with google but uh, so none of the parties has to actually share the data with the other party what happens is inside the google infrastructure suppose an advertiser has a hashed email id an encrypted email id and yes. the publisher has suppose in this case new york times or any other website has a hashed email id they would be able to work on use cases such as overlap understanding their audience for an example this audience use case or audience activation use case i can directly know that there are 150000 users who are working or giving me a good re- return on ad spend on a particular website such as such as newyorktimes.com with the help of a google solution of pair and with the help of their uh, dsp that is display in video 360 dv360 advertiser would be able to directly push that audience of 150000 users that can be used by that advertiser to showcase more ads on newyorktimes.com in this process advertiser never had to share the right away email ids with new york times and vice right. versa new york times never had to share email ids with either the advertiser as well so it allows for us to be rest assured in a way that an email id will never be visible to the either party and still the work that is expected would be done in the most privacy safe manner and that's where a clean room comes into place and google is uh, uh facilitating this as a piece of tech in its own as well yes thank you so much for that explanation um let's just contrast that for a second i know in a previous conversation we have said that and and this happened in olden days too that one advertiser would team up with one media property and they would make a deal together i think disney uh was one that we talked about yes. so you know somebody or nike you know nike wants to get on disney properties so nike and disney mm-hmm. together figure out how to hash emails how to make sure but there there would have to be uh a lot of special customized negotiating and then in the technology you probably have to have um someone acting as an escrow you know to to hold on to these things but not to uh, be partial to either side so you're saying that if we wanted to now all of a sudden go with you know n number of publishers and n number of advertisers that folks like google are going to uh use pair to facilitate that correct 
Yeah, that's correct. And and you uh, you highlighted the right example of N advertisers and N publishers. Until now, even though they were supposed to be one is to one deals or direct deals, uh, what this solution offers is one advertiser can partner with hundred publishers, and vice versa. That is, one par- publisher can also partner with hundred advertisers. That means right. if you have to enrich your data in one or the other way for audience profiling or audience expansion for having more and more reach. you don't need to constrain yourself as an advertiser to be reliable only on the big publishers what it allows us for is to combine your data with a publisher that works well in your favor so whether it's a small publisher and giving you better returns why don't you analyze your data with that publisher and make sure that you are consistently performing good on on that website even as if it has less reach but good return on ad spend so it brings in the quality of the media to be better with time the yes. more you analyze the data in a one on one basis like this but eventually what at a higher level is happening is you can partner with n publishers if you are nike and if you are disney then you can partner with n advertisers as well and it's a win win situation for all of them and nobody is bypassing any kind of user level uh, regulation no it seems like yeah it's win 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 um because the users who are receiving these ads their safety in numbers they know that they're not being individually tracked the uh both the advertisers and the publishers it would be a full time job just setting up these direct buys and direct deals so it, it can work all around now i'm going to give a little bit of editorial and you don't have to respond to this but we've got ad tech particularly the parties like google you know yes they will say they have pair and they explain that it is a separate entity and meta and others are saying the same thing but they're continuing to do the practice which they have been known for and which people in government regulators have been leery about all along this is that they have control over so much of the ecosystem that we're basically just trusting their word that they are being uh they're using fair market pricing right that the auction isn't skewed uh and that they aren't using um anti-competitive practices within their own area so um and, and I guess I'll just finish by saying that the principles which clean rooms are built by do seem if they're universally applied to take us out of that world of being a complete black box cuz that's where we are right now but uh we are also not going over to the other edge where we have to track everything about the users and that information is being traded without the users consent in all directions so it seems to me like clean rooms in principle should be better than the way it is now but i'm still flagging the fact that the big ad tech players um yeah. are are the somewhat random element in this equation yeah i i have something to add that's a that's a, a, a correct way to put like it's too much power sometimes in the in only a few hands so right. uh there is another thing happening in this dynamic shift of ad tech industry with all the privacy rules changing and the things that we discussed in the last couple of minutes just like google amazon and facebook are the wall gardens that are that have been there in the market for like such a long time yeah. because there is a need of showing various kinds of ads on various websites and it's already happening other kinds of wall gardens are emerging as well so that means people do not have to rely only on these top 3 big platforms yes. and every advertiser whether it's small medium large can diversify their ad spend by spending more into other areas such as different retail retail media networks example macy's.com zappos.com like i can post and if i am lakme or loreal i can post an ad on macy's.com and i can also be a seller on macy's.com at the same time if i want to sell a shoe i can sell it on many websites but if zappos.com is offering me to place an ad if i am vans or if i am nike or adidas if i can place an ad on zappos.com and share 
that, okay, this is a great shoe to buy, then I can diversify my ad spend. And the moment I'm diversifying, even though I have a lot of ad spend in other big, big tech players, yes. I know that I am getting the right, I am reaching to the right audience through other players in the market available as well. And you may have heard the news right. that Uber is also launching advertising. Uber launching their advertising, Macy's having their retail media already in place. So all these websites and connected TV players also coming in this space. Right. right. Everybody is going to have so many options to just play around with their ad spend. It's a, it's like a good and bad thing. You have many options, but then you have to deal with many options. It's important to note that uh, in early 2023, um, the Wall Street Journal, which tracks the amount of concentration in digital ads in the U.S., uh, marked uh, uh, the first time in five or six years that Meta and Google together did not equal over 50% of market share. So perhaps you're prediction is coming true that people are using other places and because inventory can be exchanged without worry through clean rooms this this is it, it seems like it could be working yeah uh, i think inventory is the right word you use uh, uh, people are realizing that there's more options uh, uh, trustworthy reliable sometimes cheap as well uh, and it it allows you to get to the right audience so Yes. And I want to cover what it means for a smaller mid-sized advertiser because they are the ones who can uh, be using this. Likely, they're not already using it. It's been used by the largest entities. But before we get into that, we're going to take a very quick break. I'm taking a moment to talk about the new Google Analytics in early 2023, the in-person GA Fast Forward workshops will happen in Ottawa, Kingston, Montreal, as well as across upstate New York. You can go now and see registration details or get notified when it's happening in your area. Just go to gafastforward.com, spelled as you'd say it, or GAFAST, the number four, then W-A-R-D. Let's get back to the conversation. So, Puni, if we look at what a person who has not been using uh, clean rooms yet is considering as they listen to you, I'm imagining that there's a bit of excitement, but I'm also imagining that they're worried about everything they have to learn. They have been conditioned by the ad tech platforms who are doubling as the conduit for getting to publishers. They've been conditioned to just putting their credit card in and a few basic details and then letting it run. Um, the bar is set higher if you're going to participate in a clean room. So can you tell us what your message to a smaller mid-sized advertiser would be as they look at this new way of doing it? Yes, uh, sure. And uh, I can tell from my personal experience, if I now that I'm working with uh, small, medium and enterprise clients, and I have worked in my previous jobs with small, medium and enterprise clients who were not sure how they will utilize a data clean room. Uh, the good option is that there are many data clean rooms to work on. But now, suppose if you want to choose one, you can start small on any one of them uh, uh, and start learning whether it's going to be beneficial to you or not. If you're able to learn that in your Google environment, upper funnel advertising works better than middle funnel advertising, then you would be able to just take one learning, one use case, and try to check that same thing in another clean room such as Amazon or maybe Facebook. So we don't need to have high spend. We don't need to have an end-to-end -end use case. There are people like me in this case uh, who can work with you, sit with you, create a roadmap and strategy. That's what my role is. Create a roadmap and a strategy to understand what would be the low-hanging fruits, what would be the short-term low-hanging fruits and medium to long-term strategies that can help you actually understand that your money is going in the right direction and it's giving you more returns than ever. Yeah. So it's a little bit of, let's just say, a little small learning curve is there, but there has been a lot of resources uh, companies who are working hard to make this an easier option 
and if we if i if i just put a x y axis it's like adoption versus utility the the faster we adopt the more yes. utility that you can see if you wait for adoption then you won't be able to see any kind of thing so it's like a very yes. simple matrix or x y axis graph that anybody can it's not just applicable to this thing if i have to learn a new skill such as guitar like playing a guitar i have to again think of whether i want to be the best guitar player in the world or if i have to just learn a basic thing so it's that simple as an analogy that it's applicable to everybody and not just an advertiser sometimes this question also comes sorry i'm taking a, a, a segue into the other kinds of people who get to sure. ask who ask these things not just an advertiser but small and medium sized agencies also ask sometimes whether is this the right tool for us because it's a tool for which an agency needs to have a dedicated team yes sometimes to make sure that they they allot the right data analysts they have the right media managers they have an executive leadership as an sponsor to take care of this and showcase it to their clients that it's gonna work wonders and that's where i come in and again say the same thing that you don't right. have to start big you can start small with the help of a data clean room software if not just a data clean room itself with the help of a data clean room software you don't need a data scientist you only need the right people such as a media manager who knows what's to be done in the short term what kind of problem yes. statements are to be fixed and the rest of the things can be taken care by the a clean room software company such as in this case habu in this case as a as a person it would be me because i work as a customer engineer and we will have a learning agenda or a roadmap strategy and it doesn't have to be exhaustive at all times we can work with one client small budget and see that it can still bring in the right kind of impact in the media advertising okay. or media optimization so very applicable to small advertisers medium advertisers small agencies medium agencies the takeaway message definitely. i'm getting is be open to trying and that uh yeah. it will like this framework is ready to be tested uh on whether or not it is better than the way you're doing it right now so each one of us as advertisers can think of as you said the tofu mofu bofu uh you know piece of our funnel or a particular part of you know our display at and if we think it could be better then we should take that and roll with it or if we have an agency and they come to us suggesting that we use a data clean room to try it that we go with their suggestion and at least give it a shot right that that's correct that's correct uh, give it a shot and and you won't be disheartened at all because in the last 5 years since 2018 onwards like i have seen a lot of uh small and medium sized advertisers and agencies bringing in huge analyses to the table to the executive leadership and just one use case sometimes shows the value of a platform you don't have to have five use cases to showcase to the executive leadership that it works example i was working with one of the clients uh, uh uh just understanding how frequently do people buy and how much time it takes for a person to buy after seeing an ad just a simple latency analysis or in other words a time yes. to conversion analysis allows us to say uh, to the to the the relevant people in the room that it takes 24 to 48 hours for 90% of your users to buy something or not buy something you don't need to wait for a week or 10 10 oh. days to see whether right. your advertising worked or and, not. So and just to that point, simple, you don't need to spend for 7 to 10 days. You could stop your spending sooner and reapply those dollars. Exactly. So the the natural flow of any use case leads to right. another use case. When I know that somebody is not buying something after 2 days, even if I have served an impression, then serving extra impressions would lead to only the wastage of that ad spend that means me retargeting that user may not gonna help so i would basically repurpose those dollars into prospecting audiences right. and find more users okay so let's let's we've got that you know i'm being pulled towards the way that you're talking just with all these great use cases that are coming up flipping around for a quick moment because you were mentioning you know like with all 
technology diffusion, there are going to be people who wait a very long time, wait maybe until they're pushed to do it. So let's, let's kind of talk to them for a second. So these are the people who are wedded to the idea that I need to know the identity of a person that I'm marketing to. You're saying to them instead, if I gather, something like, look at their behavior and actions. You don't need to be so worried that they're 35 to 49 and that they're in this location. You don't. Uh, and let's remember that that information about their identity, that's sitting in a cookie. <laughs> and if you do nothing yes. with the way the browsers are going and the regulators that are forcing this, those won't be around. Yes, that, that's correct. And in fact, like I think I'd, by this time, because it's such a fresh topic in everybody's minds, by this time, people have realized that they need to have various options, if not the cookie. Then what are those options looking like? Uh, and, and a lot of players are very like too much ahead in its own discovery and implementation. We have a lot of identity graph solution companies yes. already in place. These things have taken branching. I would say it's it's a it's a as an end result it's it has branched into multiple things. Some people are inclined heavily towards still knowing the customer as a customer, and they would like to know the ID of that customer. Now, even though we can we know that uh, an email address is a good way yes. to identify somebody, it may or may not be the only way to identify somebody because I can have five email addresses, right? So the other ways are pop, yes. uh, emerging as well. So Google is coming up with their own Google Topics API in which they are going to create segments within the right. Chrome browser itself. And if that comes in, of course, it comes along with the third-party cookie deprecation. There would be, in, in simple words, segments of users who would be applicable to a particular category, sports, food, adventure, and whatnot, entertainment. And we would be able to basically go into different buckets and see different kinds of ads depending on our browsing history. That is another way to look at it. The, the third way is not just understanding the user identity, but the user actions. And that's where the contextual targeting yeah. comes into place. Contextual targeting is not obsessed with the user itself. Contextual targeting is obsessed with the kinds of actions are being taken by those users. And if we see a trend then we would be able to understand the consumer behavior, whether it's consumer exploratory behavior, consumer purchase behavior, consumer travel search behavior, those kind of contextual advertisements would be seen. And I, it's already there in, in multiple areas. It's just that it's never going to pop out to you that, oh, this is a contextual ad and this is a targeted ad. Right. It's never going to look like so you've that. You've got to make your peace with that. It's always going to be relatable. It's always going to be relatable that your actions yes. are being read in some yeah, meaningful I, sense. I think if, if I were to come in from the technology angle, this is now all math. It's all being run by machines that, you know, compute math. So we do have to let go uh, and allow it to pull us towards the kind of analysis that it is good at. And we have actual proof now of its prediction power to be able to use contextual and other forms of ads that maybe we as humans are unsure about, but we're unsure because the, you know, great matter in our heads has great difficulty trying to keep track of that and, and understand it. But again, safety in numbers, as we get into larger numbers of these individuals and we must for privacy, it's leaning more and more towards something that can only be done by computers. So we, we need to maybe consider that they uh, they have a, a bigger role to play in that we're cool with that. I will want to finish, Puni, with you mentioned earlier about a scavenger hunt. And as you go through this, the fervor with which you talk about this is very clear. Uh, what is it about you that made you so passionate about this area? And how did you kind of find your way here? Uh, thanks for that question. So my history in ad tech started a couple of years back. Uh, uh, I have been working at an ad tech agency before this. And before that, I was working at a publisher, Time Inc. So 
have always had the opportunity to literally learn about a single user and when that power is taken away from you to n- learn about the single user and then you're given alternate option that you can only analyze only a group of users i was taken aback a bit but i was also excited to explore that opportunity because aggregated users analysis or aggregated analysis leads to even way more different kinds of let's just say valuable actionable data or insights for, for to be to be shared with media managers and i think the the thing that keeps me close to this kind of an ad tech platform that is data clean room is that it has it has evolved so much that people have started re- relying on this as not as an optional ad tech platform in their tech stack it has become a core part of their tech stack so until couple of years back an ad server a dsp all these have been core platforms right and people knew that without this nothing would happen and people have now at this point in early 2023 have started realizing and it's been 5 years since 2017 that google launched it clean room more than 20 30 clean rooms exist in the market which are extremely famous globally as well and they are allowing us to do those things that would even just grow from here so it is not going to be an optional item in anybody's tech stack it's going to incorporate a lot of things inside it as we talked about activation activation was not a thing in the beginning as a feature of a clean room now activation is a feature earlier only measurement that is writing sql and everything now but additionally we can also write python we can build models so these things are automatically becoming more powerful and everybody's taking feedback from advertisers and uh, thought leaders in the market as to what else do you want so it's a give and take relationship some platforms have something and then we are getting some feature request and we are making it even more powerful sending alerts to the users when they know that something is going wrong is also a feature of a clean room like you don't you don't need to wait and wait and keep looking and staring at the reports yeah so activation python modeling uh, suppression frequency cap and directly plugging into the ad tech platforms itself so it's becoming part of the tech stack itself and now and i'm again going back to one of the topics we discussed a couple of minutes back that is identity some clients are going to be heavy on identity mm-hmm. some are not so identity integrations are also becoming part of the clean rooms themselves that means i don't have to buy somebody else's product when i know that something is already integrated within a clean room so what i'm ah. getting is a package so a clean room is becoming a package and because it's becoming a package it's getting that attention and that attention leads to more and sure. more people getting involved eventually becoming a sure. core part of the ad stack sure it's a ad it's text. a protocol i mean we all trust email and it, it sounds a lot like that the um future as you describe it and as the team at Habu are working on um you know you sound very upbeat about it uh and it does sound like a uh it's going to be an increasingly important if not mandatory part of what marketers are going to need to know puni if people want to find out more about you or more about habu where can they go yes uh, so feel free to read uh, reach out to me either on linkedin or my email okay. uh, but we'll i think for company like habu.com yeah uh, thanks so company habu.com uh, you can directly reach out to me i can connect you with the right people i can introduce you to the right company and offer solutions Fantastic. as well thanks so much for coming on today I know yeah, that people thanks, have yep. probably had their brains expanded. I know I have, and my hope is that they come away with something that makes their funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.